Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm a journalist based out in Reykjavik, Iceland, where this week, it feels like spring, man. I think it's happening. I mean, don't quote me on that. We could have snowstorms and uh, horror again any day now, <laughs> but we're almost into May. Uh, the nights are getting lighter, the sun is getting higher. It's pretty nice out here. I played a, a bunch of great games this week. The first and foremost among them was Paradise Killer, a very, very strange and interesting narrative detective game where you have to solve a murder case in a kind of a dystopian tropical island where there are Lovecraftian gods and demons at work, but also a very strange neon art style. It's a very intoxicating brew of uh, strange strangeness, including the disco-y electronic synth-pop soundtrack that we're listening to right now. Uh, so that was a really interesting game, and I'll be reviewing that one. Um, I also picked up a few new games this week. I had a recommendation from Ashley Broken Pixel on Twitter, at Broken Pixel, and he recommended The Longing to me. I know this was in an Indie World showcase recently uh, for Switch, and people have been talking about this game. It's a game where you start the game, and I think then it lasts for 400 days, no matter how much you play it or don't play it. Uh, so the name, I guess, is a joke about being long, um, but it's basically a game where you play like an elf who lives in a, alone in a, a deep dungeon, and you can just explore it at a very slow pace, there are things to read, things to explore, things to experience, and it's about um, longevity. Seems kind of interesting, so I picked it up. Um, it's only, I think it was £12 or something, and I've added it to my list of games that I'll be reviewing in the coming months. I also played a little bit of Art School. Um, this was a controversial game. I think gamers came out against it for not being a game. Um, I can kind of get it. It's, it's a very funny little project. It's almost like a kind of something that you'd find on Itch. In fact, Itch is where I played it because it was in the, the bundle for racial justice and equality um, that was produced by Itch last year. That bundle turns out to be really good. It's, every now and then I feel like I want to play something like um, recently I wanted to play Read Only Memories. And before I buy things on Steam, I go and look if they're in the Itch bundle. And Read Only Memories was. Art School is another game that pops up on lists sometimes. It's a very strange little game where you play someone who's starting art school in a colourful, candy-coloured 3D world. You run around, there's not much to do. You're given the task of drawing stuff, which you can do on your Mac touchpad, or I guess if you get it on the Switch, on the touch screen. And then your artwork is rated by an AI. And you can only create things that look like they were done on MS Paint. And the tasks are all kind of silly, but you get more colours, more brushes, um, I had a fun hour with it. I'll probably play through the rest of the um, assignments just to see what happens at the end. It's a bizarre little game. So I played a bit of Art School too. We might hear more about that in a future episode. Also added to the list is Narita Boy, which came out recently. It's uh, published by Team17 and they were good enough to provide me with a review code. I've played the first two or three hours of it and I'm having a good time. It's, it's aesthetically beautiful. It's presented in pixel art that's stretched as if it was on a CRT monitor. It has these kind of strange digital distortion effects going on and a fantastic 80s soundtrack. Um, it's a very cool game. It's got Tron and Lawnmower Man vibes in the, the complex plot, deep lore, hack and slash gameplay. If you're a fan of Hyperlight Drifter and if you're a fan of pixel art and CRT style games in general, um, it's it's going to be a good one, Narita Boy. I'll probably be featuring that one on the next episode because I'm playing quite a lot of it at the minute. I'm also still planning to do episodes about Immortals Phoenix Rising. I'm still trying to power through it. It's a long game. It's a big Ubisoft open world game. Very good though, I have to say. Breath of the Wild fans, that will scratch the itch while you're waiting for the, the sequel. It's actually just a very, very good game that crosses Assassin's Creed gameplay with Breath of the Wild open world exploration and a super cool uh, Hades-like Greek mythology storyline. I'm loving it. Uh, and I'm also going to hopefully be talking to the creator of Nuts soon, the Apple Arcade surveillance game with a, a few shades of Firewatch. Um, I'm hoping to put that interview together this week, so there'll be news on that one soon too. So that's everything I've been playing and everything that I've got lined up. 
But before I get to talking about Paradise Killer, I'd like to thank the newest patron on the show's Patreon, who is Curlsburgers, a wonderful streamer who I watch all the time on YouTube and Twitch. He does an Enter the Gungeon daily, and it's really, really entertaining. I love Curlsburgers, so thank you very much for signing up for Patreon Curlsburgers. And if you would like to support the show by signing up for our Patreon, whether you're a first-time listener today and you like what you hear, or whether you're a, a long-time listener who enjoys all of the the podcasts that I put out week on week, you can support the show from as little as a dollar a month, or a, a euro or a pound, at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild. I produce um, sale recommendations, so if you're a busy person or you don't have the time to scroll through a bunch of pages looking for stuff, I boil down all the things that are on sale that have been featured on past episodes of the show, so you can save yourself some time and get some cheap games that will hopefully repay that membership fee in no time at all. We also have a super cool Discord server where listeners of the show all get together and talk about game recommendations, what they're playing, sharing screenshots, sharing music people are listening to, movies, top fives. We have a top five section that's really fun. I also make extra episodes for my patrons occasionally. I'm aiming to do one every quarter. I just did one about music. It has 10 tracks from my record collection that I really, really love. Um, I really had fun making that episode. It's like a radio show that's about an hour long, describing how I discovered these tracks and talking about the artists. So if you'd like to hear a music podcast from me and to get all of those other extra benefits, you can sign up at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild and I will love you forever. And with that out of the way, let's move on and talk about the featured game of the episode, Paradise Killer. So Paradise Killer is a 2020 game by Kaizen Gameworks. It's their debut game. Um, It was published by a fellow traveler, a really interesting publisher that focus on narrative-led games. They they published In Other Waters, which is a big favourite of mine, so I'm always keen to see what fellow traveller are up to. And Paradise Killer is quite an eccentric game. It's really unusual. I haven't played anything quite like it. Um, it was really a dizzying game and kind of compelling for that reason, among others. It's an open-world murder investigation game in which you'll walk around, you'll talk to suspects, you'll collect clues, collect evidence, you'll try and find tucked away hidden objects and hidden truths to try and piece together a mystery. And it takes place on a bizarre tropical island. Um, Really, really strange place with a a really bizarre aesthetic that really, it's just eye-popping from start to finish. Um, And the game will culminate in a trial when you bring all the evidence that you've discovered to trial in front of a judge and you try and put forward a truth and find out what happened. And kind of in keeping with the generally confusing style of this game, and I say that in a good way for the most part, the story and the lore of the game are deeply tangled. It's a game that has um, a game world with deep lore. Um, Every character has a backstory that is interesting and usually in some way pertinent to your investigation. And the game world itself, it takes place on Island 24, this kind of neon tropical parallel universe island in which a strange cabal of a ruling class called the Syndicate govern over a populace of abducted humans who form a permanent underclass are sacrificed to gods and who are generally thought of as second-class citizens. And you play as an exiled investigator of Island 24 called Lady Love Dies, sometimes referred to as LD by her friends. And you've been brought back from exile because of a serious crime. What has happened is the ruling council of the syndicate were gathered in their sealed meeting chamber And they've been killed. They've been murdered in strange circumstances. It's a locked room. No one can get in to examine the scene. But a demon-possessed human called Henry was found outside the council chambers, covered in blood, out of his mind. He doesn't remember anything because the demon that possesses him had just taken over him. He's holding a murder weapon. The blood of the council has been found on his hands and in his stomach. And it seems like an open and shut case. But as you will expect from a murder mystery game, it's absolutely not the case. Several members of the syndicate seem very keen for this to be uh, adjudicated on straight away and for Henry to be convicted of the crime. 
and executed because that's the only punishment for this kind of crime on the island on the supposed paradise which is actually a kind of a bizarre dystopia and it's immediately apparent that there's a lot more going on than meets the eye so that's the basic setup you'll walk around the island it's first person and you'll walk around the island you'll talk to all of the people that are left on the island which is midway through an evacuation for reasons for plot reasons that I'll come to later and you have to interview all of the different people that were there all of the different potential witnesses potential suspects they all have very strange backstories going on and they all have very distinctive personalities and you have to question them on possible motives on possible alibis on whether they saw anything on whether they've heard anything and as you talk to different characters walking around the island and exploring it will unlock clues they're all uh, put into your case files which are really neatly organized for you by person and by the variety of crimes that will come to light as having taken place on this island and they'll unlock different dialogue options so every time you find one clue and question someone and a new piece of information comes to light other dialogue options will unlock on different characters around the island so you'll find yourself walking around the island looking for the relevant people finding them getting to know their personalities and backstories getting clues from them uh, you can probe them and press them or you can try and get them on your side you can take different routes in the conversations and try and uncover what has gone down on island 24 And there really is a tangled story here. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to hold in your mind at one time. Um, the reason that the island is under evacuation, for example, is that the syndicate is in the constant process of trying to create the perfect island, the perfect living space for them to live forever, to rule over their subjects, to uh, sacrifice the subjects to alien gods, and to ultimately summon back those gods to live among the gods who will live in pyramids that are on islands surrounding the main island and so there's a kind of a, a strange Lovecraftian vibe to this whole thing but when we talk about Lovecraftian fantasy and Lovecraftian horror um, what comes to mind is usually games like maybe Cultist Simulator or The Sinking City these dark games with uh, dark Victorian back alleyways and like creaking old buildings and macabre characters with you know, sunken, haunted eyes and all of this kind of strange horror that we associate with H.P. Lovecraft. But this game is so stylistically different to that that it's, it's uh, bizarre to even use the word Lovecraftian, which is an overused word, I know, but which does apply here. And, and that's because the island is a tropical island and it has more in common with, like, the setting of Miami Vice than it does with the setting of Sweeney Todd or some other Victorian horror and uh, Lovecraft stuff is often set in that, that kind of dark suit and poverty kind of Victorian London atmosphere. And this game has an 80s sheen to it. Um, all of the buildings are like concrete modernist blocks. The architecture is kind of amazing. It reminds me of the South Bank of London or like uh, modern art museums that you'll find in uh, the centre of most capital cities. These big hulking concrete chunks of architecture. Um, the sky is usually blue and the clouds are flying overhead. It's bright sunlight all the time. There are beaches, there are uh, promenades, um, and there is this kind of pumping synth pop soundtrack that sounds like a disco or like synth wave music. Disco influenced synth wave with lots of kind of disco bass and synthy washes going on. And so it has the atmosphere of like a holiday resort, like, um, like Malaga beachfront or something, but with this kind of temples built into it there are places that are obvious sites of sacrifice where there is a blood splattered ground and kind of gourds for blood to be gathered in after sacrifices um, and all of this happening in a an easy breezy kind of bright first person island scenario with palm trees around you and stuff it's a really really odd combination and it's kind of discombobulating i found it very confusing to move through island 24 um, in part because there is so much going on. 
You'll move through kind of tenement blocks where the evacuated people lived. You'll move through these kind of swanky apartment blocks where syndicate members live. And there are these all of these bureaucratic buildings with huge concrete walkways that look almost like pyramids. And so it's this real mixture of mythology and horror and a strange kind of UK architecture. <laughs> and there is just so much going on. Um, and there's like a big kind of capitalist strand going through it too. There is like a soft drink brand with drinks all over the island, drink machines all over the island. And there is just so much going on that it's, it's really confusing. I'm, I think of when I've been disorientated in a mall or, you know, like a, um, like a bowling alley or something where there's just music coming at you from lots of different areas and flashing lights. And you're not exactly sure what's going on. There's video screens everywhere. Um, it's disorientating to you because there is so much stimulus so it's this kind of mall feeling mixed with this tourist island feeling, mixed with this dark horror, this dystopia, and this murder mystery. And it's a lot to unpack, and it kind of works. Um, it really shouldn't work, but it really does. Um, as I was exploring the island, I was constantly amused by the, the details that you find, all of the kind of evacuated apartments that you'll find, and all of the different sectors of the island all have something going on. It's a very um, engaging environment in which your adventure takes place. Lots of environmental storytelling. Um, and you're trying to kind of orientate yourself within the politics of the island, within what's going on with the syndicate, what's going on with the gods. There are kind of bureaucrats. There are architects. Um, and the characters are really, really bizarre as well. So on top of all of that kind of environmental and situational and sort of scenario weirdness, you have a, a completely oddball cast. And yeah, the reason that the island is all but evacuated is that when there is a demonic possession in this paradise island, um, it can cause a big disaster in the kind of the Death Stranding sense of, you know, when someone dies in Death Stranding, it's like a, a huge kind of almost atomic event. Um, and it's kind of the same on this island. So there has been a demonic event, there is a dead zone that is sealed off um, and the architect of the island has built a new island that they're referring to as Perfect 25. You'll see billboards for it everywhere and at the end of each island cycle the old island disintegrates. Everyone uh, transfers themselves across to the next island which they always think is going to be perfect and you've been called back from your exile at the moment where Island 24 is being evacuated and everyone has gone. The humans have all been sacrificed and the syndicate are in the middle of being transferred across to Island 25. So it's a complicated scenario and it's a lot to get your head around. I mean, as well as doing your murder investigation, you are trying to learn all of this. And I still feel like I have got like half of a grasp on it after finishing the game. But I have to say it's a super compelling setting. It's a super compelling visual style that the game has. And it's just incredibly intriguing and engrossing. And I was really sucked in for the whole time I was playing it. I played it over three days, I think in about 10 or 12 hours. And it's, it's such a vivid experience um, and such a weird experience. It's a real one-off. And I would like to talk a little bit more about the, the visual style of the game, because it's, it's so unusual. Um, the graphics are very bright, very day glow. They are garish, um, they are weird, and it doesn't feel like a kind of a current generation game. It feels like a game, I, I can't position it precisely, um, because I don't have full knowledge of the, the PlayStation generations, but my guess would be that this looks like a game that could have been on PlayStation 2 maybe? Um, I did have a PlayStation 2 back in the day, and it feels like it could have been on that console. There are some strange, there are some strange kind of cut-up um, moments. For example, when you're walking along a walkway next to a dramatic waterfall, um, the water hits the concrete, and rather than spraying or making the concrete wet or shiny, the water just ends like it's been cut off. Um, and there is constantly northern lights and aurora rippling across the sky at night but it comes with a very strange kind of pixelated texture to it that heightens this synthetic feeling that everything has. So sometimes as you're walking around, it feels more like um, more like you're looking at a digital collage in some way, 
I took a lot of screenshots in this game. There are so many strange moments where you'll be walking through blocks of flats that feel very familiar, at least if you're from the north of England or an English city, and then suddenly you'll come into a, a plaza where there are these kind of statues of horned gods in glittering purple rock um, and pots full of blood where people have been sacrificed and it's very really jarring and cut up. I was constantly taking screenshots and snapshots of it. And this, this, um, this visual quality um, also applies to the characters because the characters aren't 3D models, they're 2D. So as you're walking towards them, you'll see a 2D cutout of a character, a still, basically. Um, and it's a little bit like Doom, if you remember the, the original Doom. The enemies in Doom were flat, and as you turn, they just turn towards you, basically. Um, and so it's, it's like that. They're just 2D cutouts. And when you walk up to them and talk to them, um, the screen mode will flip, and there'll be a, a, an illustration of the character on the left, and their dialogue will appear below them. Um, there is voice acting for this game, but it's so um, bad that I actually turned it off in the first half hour of the game. Um, the voice actors don't actually read the script. They just have a few stock phrases that will be repeated again and again. Um, and the recording quality is really off. Some of them sound like they were recorded in a shoebox. Um, and I, I found it very distracting. So I turned off the voice acting straight away. Um, and I think I had a much better experience because of that. And, but the illustration of the characters is is kind of odd too. Um, it's it's not like Hades where it's this beautiful kind of illustrative, painterly kind of arty, well realized uh, portraits. They're kind of like comic book sketches each character, and there isn't really an uh, I would I would say there isn't really a unifying aesthetic. Like their faces all seem slightly done in different styles, if you know what I mean. Um, so the art style of the game is a little all over the place when it comes to the illustration aspect of it. But it does work, and it gives it a certain atmosphere. It gives the game a retro atmosphere that just adds to the whole giant cake of uh, strangeness, if you know what I mean. But the characters themselves are actually excellent. They are completely weird. Um, there is a, such a, a bizarre variety of cast members with such a, a bizarre variety of roles and backstories there is the architect. She is the the architect of the islands. She's like a high-minded aesthete, and she designs each island, um, trying to make the, f the most flawless island. And in some of your conversations with her, she'll kind of expound different theories of uh, architecture and design. You, know, you can have these conversations where, as well as questioning them, you can also just chat to them to try and build up your relationship with them. And the more times you do that, You'll get, they'll volunteer information or they'll even give you gifts if you get to the maximum friendship level. So yeah, there's the architect. There is Crimson Acid, one of the most bizarre characters. She's a ram-headed uh, supermodel and pop cultural icon of Island 24 who lives in a sewer beneath the residential area. Um, and she's kind of a pop star, but she has a background as a, a soldier, as it turns out. It's just... So strange, the writing. Then there is Dr. Doom Jazz. He's like a Scottish punk with a mohawk. And he lives on a yacht by the marina. Um, and he's like a... He is the doctor of the syndicate, but he also acts as the the forensic examiner. So you'll have to return to him often for obvious reasons. There is uh, Shinji, a mysterious blue demon who just appears all over the map every time you kind of go under a bridge or climb stairs to the top of a tower block or walk across some cliffs or the beach, you can find Shinji. He's just tucked away everywhere. And you'll have a series of strange conversations with him before he spits out some kind of strange non sequitur and then vanishes cackling. Um, so the, char the character list is, is really cool. Um, and you can hold down L2 anywhere you are on the map. You can hold down L2 and you can look around and see where the characters are positioned. They kind of stay static for most of the time. It's just to help you orientate yourself because the map is just a giant labyrinth of tower blocks and beaches and uh, shopping areas and kind of bureaucratic buildings. Um, you'll get lost a lot. I got lost a lot. But as you're wandering, you're also finding collectibles. So as you're walking between all of these strange characters, you'll find blood crystals, which are the currency of the game. Uh, you can spend them in drinks machines. You can spend them 
on these kind of strange bloodletting mini pyramids where if you spend a blood crystal, you can let blood into this strange receptacle and receive a collectible. Um, you'll find foot spars. It turns out there are only three of these foot spars and they, they are really inconspicuous and I missed them for most of the game, but they all give you extra abilities in the game. I kind of wish that they'd been flagged up a little more. And so as you can probably tell from the kind of discursive and somewhat rambling description of this game that I'm giving, there is just a lot going on here. And that's where we come to the, the downsides of the game. For, for all of the upsides that it has and all of the eccentricity and strangeness that is present in this game, there are some real downsides. I will say that the, the map is very poor. It doesn't show you where you are or which way you're facing. It's a very basic, basic map, like a, like a tourist map. Just kind of, uh, it shows you roughly which region you're in, but that's it. It's uh, singularly unhelpful in getting around the island. I will also say there is um, quite a lot of visual clutter in this game. And while it does add to the environment, it makes for confusing exploring. Um, and in a game where you have to find every last clue to solve the crime, or to get closer to it, or to open up a new lead, um, the idea of missing something just because you missed one alleyway whilst coming through quite a complex game area is a bit of a bummer. Um, also, there's the, the blood crystal system. So you, you find blood crystals everywhere. You're never short of them, but there are a few ways to spend them that felt a little um, pointless to me. For example, the drinks machines, the bloodletting stations. Um, and what was the other one? There's a third way to spend them that I didn't do very much of. Oh yeah, the foot spars. So between those three things, they, they gobble up your blood crystals. And if you're like me, you'll try and stockpile collectible game items in case you need a big chunk of them later. Um, and the game didn't really signpost me towards spending them in those ways. Like, I didn't understand what those game elements were for. Um, and that, that led me up a bit of a blind alley at one point in the game. There were a couple of other blind alleys, finally. Um, there were a couple of um, physical puzzles that need switches to turn things on, move things around, raise and lower things, usual game stuff. And those felt a bit tacked on and obligatory to me. I think the game would have been better without those. It seems that every game seems to feel obligated to have switch puzzles or block puzzles, even when they really don't need them. And finally, there were um, a couple of episodes of Moon Logic. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase Moon Logic, but it's from point-and-click games and kind of means... Um, puzzles in which the solution doesn't seem tied to the outcome. Just like, try this with this and see if this happens. Like, try element A with element B, and then element K will occur. And there were a couple of moments where I felt a little stuck, um, and so I dipped into a guide and I found the solution, and I thought, well, that's just a bit silly. It's like something on one side of the map affects something on the other side of the map. Um, so that's all my critiques of the game. It's the map, the currency, a little bit of visual clutter, and a little bit of uh, game designy stuff when it comes to puzzles. So I would say for the most part, the game is actually very successful in what it tries to do. I believe it's trying to create like a, a dizzying world where there is so much going on, where the truth can be kind of constructed um, I think the, the game aims to not be like a basic whodunit, but rather a very plural and open-ended uh, murder mystery in which you can kind of paint a picture at trial with whatever you found. But the more that you found, the more insight that you'll have and the more closure you will get. Um, and that's about as far as I can go without giving spoilers of this game. I've tried to skate around it. This is just a description of the mechanics, the strengths and the flaws of the game. So I won't say anything more about it, but all in all, I have to say that Paradise Killer was a very interesting experience, a very unusual ex game experience. I'm very glad that I played it. It had a, a completely unique way of telling a story, and it is quite a story um, for people that are interested in the kind of the aesthetic mashup. And I would say just in methods of game storytelling, um, the game is just notable at the very least, and, and for me it was very enjoyable. It's available on Switch and Steam. I played it on Switch where it performed very well. There was a little bit of pop in, but nothing, nothing to write home about. So it's a thumbs up from me. Really interesting little indie game. That's Paradise Killer.
Wow, that's a very basement jacks uh, bass sound that they put into that track on the on the Paradise Killer soundtrack. I uh, hope you enjoyed hearing about that game. Um, thanks very much for listening. This has been Gaming in the Wild. I've been John Rogers. You can follow me on social media at Gaming in the Wild on Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. I'm very appreciative of anyone that wants to sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild. Also very happy if anyone leaves five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts that really helps people discover the podcast. So thanks very much for listening. Take care of yourselves and each other. I'll be back next week. Bye-bye for now.